The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. This is chapter three. The creative function of the word, the symbolic and the real. Thinking always begins from our position within the symbolic order. In other words, we cannot but consider the supposed time before the word from within our symbolic order using the categories and filters it provides. We may try to think ourselves back to a time before words, to some sort of pre-symbolic or pre-linguistic moment in the development of homo, homo sapiens or in our own individual development, but as long as we are thinking, language remains essential. In order to conceive of that time, we give it a name, the real. Lacan tells us that the letter kills. It kills the real which was before the letter, before words, before language. It is, of course, the letter itself, which at the stage at which Lacan formulates this, 1956, seminar on the purloined letter, is not distinguished from the signifier, words, or language that informs us of its own lethal properties and thus of the real that would have been out for the letter's advent that would have been, oh sorry, um, and thus of the real that would have been but for the letter's advent. The real is, for example, an infant's body before it comes under the sway of the symbolic order, before it is subjected to, to to toilet training and instructed in the ways of the world. In the course of socialization, the body is progressively written or overwritten with signifiers. Pleasure is localized in certain zones, while other zones are neutralized by the word and coaxed in compliance with social behavioral norms. Taking Freud's notion of polymorphous perversity to the extreme, we can view the infant's body as but one unbroken erogenous zone, there being no privileged zones, no areas in which pleasure is, some, is circumscribed at the outset. So too, Lacan's real is without zones, subdivisions, localized highs and lows, or gaps and plenitudes. The real is a sort of unrent, undifferentiated fabric, woven in such a way as to be full everywhere, there being no space between the threads that are its stuff. It is a sort of smooth, seamless surface, or space which applies as much to a child's body as to the whole universe. The division of the real into separate zones, distinct features, and contrasting structures is a result of the symbolic order, which, in a manner of speaking, cuts into the smooth facade of the real, creating divisions, gaps, and distinguishable entities, and laying the real to rest that is, drawing or sucking it into the symbols used to describe it and thereby annihilating it. Cancelling out the real, the symbolic creates reality. Reality is that which is named by language and can thus be thought and talked about. The social construction of reality implies a world that can be designated and discussed with the words provided by social groups or subgroups, language. What cannot be said in its language is not part of its reality. It does not exist, strictly speaking. In Lacan's terminology, existence is a product of language. Language brings things into existence, makes them part of human reality. Things which had no existence prior to being ciphered, symbolized, or put into words. The real, therefore, does not exist since it precedes language. Lacan reserves a separate term for it, borrowed from Heidegger, Heidegger. it exists, but exists is, is like E-X hyphen S-I-S-T-S. It exists outside of or apart from our reality. Obviously, insofar as we name and talk about the real and weave it into a theoretical discourse on language and the time before the word, we draw it into language and thereby give a kind of existence to that which, in its very concept, has only existence. I shall explore this point further in chapter 8. But we need not think in strictly temporal terms. The real need not be understood as merely before the better, or before the letter. In the sense of disappearing altogether once a child has assimilated language, as if it, in any case, a child could ever assimilate all of language, or all at once. The real is perhaps best understood as that which has not yet been symbolized, 
remains to be symbolized or even resists symbolization. And it may perfectly well exist alongside and in spite of a speaker's considerable linguistic capabilities. In that sense, part of the psychoanalytic process clearly involves allowing an, an analysand to put into words that which has remained unsymbolized for him or her, to verbalize experiences which may have occurred before the analysand was able to think about them, speak of them, or formulate them in any way at all. The verbal apparatus at the analysand's disposal later in life enables the analysand to transform those earlier un those earlier unspoken, never conceptualized or incompletely conceptualized experiences by talking, hence the talking cure, as Anna O oh called it back in the earliest days of psychoanalysis. Lacan's distinction between reality and the real allows us to isolate an ideological or ethical difference between certain forms of psychoanalysis and Lacanian psychoanalysis. Every person's reality differs by the mere fact that every cultural and religious group, subculture, family, and set of friends develops its own words, expressions, and idiosyncratic meanings. And every analysis reality is colored or permeated by notions about the world, about human nature, the gods, magic, business, education, music, and so on, that may in no way coincide with any particular analyst's notions. Now, while certain psychoanalysts have taken it upon themselves to straighten their patients out regarding reality, attempting to influence or change their beliefs about a wide range of subjects, Lacan insists again and again that it is an, an analyst's job to intervene in the patient's real, not in the patient's view of reality. From a, from a Lacanian perspective, the presupposition of psychoanalysis has always been that the symbolic can have an impact upon the real ciphering and thereby transforming or reducing it. Depicted schematically, the symbolic bars, the real, overwriting and erasing it. And now there's like, I don't know, a table, well, not a table, I don't know, a diagram. It's just symbolic with a line over real. Trauma. One of the faces of the real that we deal with in psychoanalysis is trauma. If we think of the real as everything that has yet to be symbolized, language no doubt never completely transforms the real, never drains all of the real into the symbolic order. A residuum is always left. In analysis, we are not interested in just any old resid residuum, re residuum, but in that residual experience that has become a stumbling block to the patient. The goal of analysis is not to exhaustively symbolize every last drop of the real, for that would make of analysis a truly infinite process, but rather to focus on those scraps of the real which can be considered to have been traumatic. By getting an analysand to dream, daydream, and talk, however incoherently, about a traumatic event, we make him or her connect it up with words, bring it into relation with ever more signifiers. To what end? Trauma implies fixation or blockage. Fixation always involves something which is not symbolized, language being that which allows for substitution and displacement, the very antithesis of fixation. To oversimplify momentarily, imagine a man fascinated by blue eyes, his mother having had blue eyes, while no two sets of eyes are ever absolutely identical, and no two shades of blue either, for that matter. The word blue allows him to equate his mother's blue eyes with a partner's blue eyes, and thus to transform his fascination with the former to the latter. Language allows for such equations, and thus for the substitution of one loved object for another, or the displacement of cathexis from one object to another. When, as is the case in melancholia, no such substitution or displacement is possible, fixation is at work, and some part of the real remains to be symbolized. By inciting the analysand to say it, and bring it into relation with ever more signifiers, it undergoes dialectic dialectization, being drawn into the dialectic or movement of the analysis discourse and set in motion. This is a fairly simplistic account that does not attempt to account for the constitution of trauma ex post facto or to distinguish between fixation and the fundamental fantasy, but it can perhaps serve our purposes momentarily. 
allowing us to begin with the straightforward model in Table 3.1. We can think of the real as being progressively symbolized in the course of a child's life. Less and less of that first original real, call it R, being left uh, behind, though it can never all be drained away, neutralized, or killed. There is thus always a remainder which persists alongside the symbolic. So table point three, or table three point one is on page forty six, and it's basically just real one, two symbolic two real two. We can, however, also show that the symbolic order itself gives rise to a second order real. One way of describing this process is found in a part of Lacan's postface to the seminar on the purloined letter that was left in abeyance in the preceding chapter, the part where Lacan introduces the cause. For this symbolic order, as modeled by Lacan's numeric and alphabetic matrices, produces something in the course of its autonomous operation that goes beyond the symbolic order itself. I will try to show how in just a moment, but note first that this allows us to postulate two different levels of the real. One, a real before the letter, that is, a pre-symbolic real, which in the final analysis is but our own hypothesis, R1. And two, a real after the letter, which is characterized by impasses and impossibilities due to the relations among the elements of the symbolic order itself, R2, that is, which is generated by the symbolic. In what does this real after the letter consist? It has several faces, one of which I will illustrate on the basis of the one, two, three chain discussed in chapter two. In the simplified model of overlapping symbol application, we saw that a three could not directly follow a one. Thus, in the position immediately following the one, we can view three as a sort of a residue. It cannot be used in the circuit and amounts to a simple leftover or scrap. At every step, at least one number is excluded or pushed aside. We can thus say that the chain works around it, that is, that the chain forms by circumventing it, tracing thereby its contour. Lacan calls these excluded numbers or symbols the caput mortem of the process, likening them thereby to the remainder left at the bottom of a test tube or beaker as an alchemist attempted to create something worthy from something lowly. The caput mortem contains what the chain does not contain, it is, in a sense, the other of the chain. The chain is an unequivocally determined, is as unequivocally determined by what it excludes as by what it includes, by what is within it as by what is without. The chain never ceases to not write the numbers that constitute the caput mortem in certain positions, being condemned to ceaselessly write something else, or say something which keeps avoiding this point, as though this point were the truth of everything the chain produces as it beats around the bush. One could go so far as to say that what of necessity remains outside the chain causes what is inside. Something must, structurally speaking, be pushed outside for there to even be an inside. The excluded symbols or letters comprising the caput mortem take on a certain materiality, akin to that of the letter the minister swipes from the queen in the story of the purloined letter, and it is less what the letters say, and insofar as they are letters they do not say anything, than their matter or object like nature, which has an effect on one character in the narrative after another. The letter in the tale fixates one character after another in a particular position. It is a real object, signifying nothing. The first real, that of trauma and fixation, returns in a sense in the form of a center of gravity, around which the symbolic order is condemned to circle. Without ever being able to hit it, it gives rise to impossibilities within the chain itself. A given word cannot appear randomly, but only after certain other words, and creates a sort of lump that the chain is forced to skirt. This will constitute for us a first approach to the second real and to Lacan's concept of cause. Interpretation hits the cause. Lacan's theory of interpretation is based to some extent, on a formulation similar to that of the caput mortem, an analysis speaks in the analytic setting. Is often, an, an, sorry, in analysis speaking, 
in the analytic setting is often unable to say, formulate, or come out with certain things. Certain words, expressions, or thoughts are unavailable to him or her at a particular moment, and he or she is forced to keep circling around them, beating around the bush, as it were, never enunciating what he or she senses to be at issue. The analysand's discourse traces a contour around that which it hovers about, circles and skirts. Those words or thoughts may become accessible to the analysand in time, in the course of analysis, but they may also be introduced by the the anal, an, analyst in the form of an interpretation. That is what Lacan means when he says that interpretation hits the cause. It hits that around which the analysand is revolving without being able to put it into words. What is unspeakable from the analysand's vantage point or position need not be unspeakable from the analyst's. Through the analyst's intervention, the analysand may be able to speak the signifier to which he or she, as subject, had been subjected, as Lacan puts it. By interpolating or bringing the analysand to pronounce the word or words, or conflation of words, assemblage, around which he or she had been circling, that inaccessible, untouchable, immovable cause is impacted. The avoidance of that absent center is mitigated, and the cause is on the road to subjectivization. This term will be explained in Chapter 5. That does not necessarily imply that the cause, the traumatic cause, was a word or an expression, though it may well be a formulation, the analysand is loath to express. Nevertheless, the analyst may jolt the analysand into taking a leap towards the word, perhaps, but a garbled or mumbled sound at first, speech with no apparent meaning, but a first step towards symbolization notwithstanding. Garbled speech and conflated words bring us closer to the stuff of language than well-articulated phrases, and serve as something of a bridge between the symbolic and the real. For while, many sounds, for while many sounds humans can produce have no socially recognizable meaning, they may nevertheless have an impact. They may be libidinally connected and have a deeper effect on the subject than words can ever tell. They may have a certain materiality and weight, and Lacan in fact includes phonemes on his multifarious list of causes. Incompleteness of the symbolic order, the whole in the other. Let us consider another tack Lacan takes regarding the second real described above. The real is also associated by Lacan with logical paradoxes, such as the anomalous catalogue of all catalogues that do not include themselves, to which we shall turn momentarily. It should first be pointed out, however, that the image provided for the symbolic order in chapter 1 a circle is but a kind of shorthand, and as such, misleading. For what could it possibly mean to speak of the set of all signifiers? As soon as we attempt to designate such a set, we add a new signifier to the list, the other, with a capital O. That signifier is not yet included within the set of all signifiers. Figure 3.1. So um, this is a circle with other um, Outside, written outside of the circle. So, pretty straightforward. Um, but it's on page 48. Let us include that new signifier within the set. We changed the set in so doing, and can now justifiably rename it, as it is no longer the same set. Suppose we call it the complete other. So, figure 3.2. So, we have um, a circle with other inside it, and then on the outside of it is complete other. This new name, however, is not yet part of the set. To include it would involve changing the set and once again call for a new name, figure 3.3. Um, so that is a circle with complete other inside of it and then complete other, uh, complete other two on the outside of it. And that one is on page 49. The process can be repeated endlessly, proving that the supposed set of all signifiers can never be complete. If nothing else, there is always the very name of the set that forever remains outside of the set. If we try to imagine a set that includes its own name, we find ourselves in a situation whereby the set includes itself, 
as one of its own elements, which is a paradoxical result, at least on the face of it. The argument here can be related to Godel's theorem concerning the incompleteness of, of, of arithmetic, generalizable in theory to all axiomatic systems. An axiomatic system can never decide upon the validity of certain statements that can be formally expressed within it using the definitions and axioms that constitute it. Such systems are thus structurally untotalizable, as in language, or as is language, i.e. the other, in Lacan's view, for the set of all signifiers does not exist. The attempt to axiomatize various fields, and Lacan can be seen as undertaking the first steps of axiomatization with his introduction of the mathemes S1, S2, S, I don't know, with like a strike thing through it, A, S, A, etc., is usually made in order to account for every possible statement that can be made in those fields. Lacan's position here is that something anomalous always shows up in language, something unaccountable, unexplainable, an aporia. These aporias point to the presence within or influence on the symbolic of the real. I refer to them as kinks in the symbolic order. Kinks in the symbolic order. An argument Bertrand Russell puzzled over in the early 20th century constitutes just such an aporia. He attempted to examine the status of a catalog of all catalogs that do not include themselves as entries. An art catalog which mentions itself in a long list of other art catalogs is perfectly imaginable, for example, and there are no doubt some which do. Consider, however, the dilemma of someone trying to create a catalog which includes only those catalogs which make no mention of themselves within their own covers. In other words, a catalog would be selected only if it did not include its own title in the list it provides of other catalogs. Should that person include the title of the catalog he or she is making in the latter's list? If he or she decides not to include it, then it too will be a catalog which does not contain itself as an entry and which therefore should be included. If, on the other hand, he or she decides to include it, then it will be a catalog which does include itself as an entry and which therefore should not be included. What is the catalog maker to do? The precise status of the catalog of all catalogs that do not include themselves ultimately remains paradoxical. It is impossible to ascertain what it contains and what it does not. Lacan's second order real, the Lacanian cause, is of precisely that nature. Its status is always akin to that of a logical exception or paradox. Structure versus cause. The aspects of the cause outlined above constitute but one approach to the concept of cause and of object A as cause in Lacanian theory, and I shall supply many others in the course of this book. Here I would like to ensure that two levels are carefully distinguished, those of structure and causation. One could certainly consider them to be ultimately equivalent to, do, to, do, to two different levels of structure or two separate levels of causation, but one would then be likely to miss the point of their radical heterogeneity. There is, on the one hand, the level of the automatic functioning of the signifying chain, illustrated by the 1, 2, 3 matrix dis discussed above. Note here that Lacan translates Freud's Wieder Hollingswag, generally translated as repetition compulsion in English, as automatism de répétition, Re repetition automat auto fuck. repetition autom automatism or repetition autom autom fuck. automaton. There is on the other. There is on the other that which interrupts the smooth functioning of this automatism namely the cause. Working in isolation, the signifying chain seems to need neither a subject nor an object, but almost in spite of itself, it produces an object and subjugates a subject. Lacan parts ways with structuralism here as structuralists attempt to explain everything in terms of the first level, that is, in terms of a more or less mathematically determinate combinatory which plays itself out without any reference whatsoever to subjects or objects. While structure plays a very important role in Lacan's work, 
and we have begun to see to what extent it pervades conscious and unconscious thought processes. It is never the whole story at any point in Lacan's development. In Seminar 10, Lacan associates the supposed progress of science, and structuralism's scientific pretensions were rarely kept secret, with our increasing inability to think the category cause. Continually filling in the gap between cause and effect, science progressively eliminates the content of the concept cause, events being viewed as leading smoothly in accordance with well-known laws to other events. Science, attempting to suture the subject, as we shall see in chapter 10, that is, trying to evict subjectivity from its field, tends also towards a suturing of the cause. The challenge of Lacanian psychoanalysis is, in part, to maintain and further explore these two primordial concepts, however paradoxical they may seem. I turn now in part two to the role assigned by Lacan to the subject and the subject's situation outside signification.